All right, well, uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm Matt Chang, the founder of Chang Industrial. Uh, we're trustees at the Chamber, and so we do, you might have seen some of the stuff that we do. Um, if not, then there'll certainly be some interesting things. The theme for today is robotic stuff that is happening around you that you probably didn't know. And uh, because we have been pulled into a lot of different industries over the past couple years, even my 20 minutes will go by fast. So we're just going to kind of choose one. And then uh, my team over here put, to get, put into the, um, the deck just kind of a hodgepodge of stuff. So we're not, we're not short on content. So I'm going to stop about mid-presentation and take questions. And then if we have time, we'll go into some other stuff. Um, so the one that we chose for today is urban vertical farming. And I think it plays off a lot of themes. I think it plays really strongly here in Arlington. My wife and I's first house was in St. Nicholas, which is just one little kind of neighborhood district over from here. We actually backed up to the Arlington River. Um, and you know what, what we're looking for in Jacksonville, in my opinion, is to use technology to really figure out how we can improve society. Do we need another strip mall? Sure, I guess if we're putting a new neighborhood in, we need another strip mall. But is that changing our, is that changing our city and giving us a sense of um, escalating job skills, um, giving us kind of equity across the different neighborhoods, some of which have better investment than others? Um, so we'll talk about that. So real quick, our company, what do we do? Basically, we design robot systems. You can tell that we went through an exercise to put a lot of fancy words to it, to our marketing people in the room, but we designed robot systems. And originally, we designed robot systems only for factories. So our most famous projects, if you were in the robotics industry and you knew who we were, um, are in factories. And that's where we've really been able to push the envelope and deliver some incredibly large, complicated systems that actually work. And that's the key is some of the incredibly large, complicated systems don't really work. Um, so we pride ourselves that ours do. And then one of the other things that we've really tried to focus on is how we can help drive innovation. Our main focus to drive innovation is through intellectual property. Um, so what it was one of those things like all good ideas, sometimes you find out by accident. We just had a number of customers asking us to help them invent something or help them commercialize an invention that they already had. Um, so anyways, what we're going to talk today about is, um, is basically a new paradigm that we're working on a P3 project in Jacksonville. So this is happening right now. You're kind of hearing about it before there's any media on it. And, um, and what we're trying to do is bring in a technology that we've already partnered with the, uh, the company that makes the technology. We've already vetted it. And we're going to uh, create vertical organic farming in Jacksonville. So vertical farming is the idea that with one little square foot of land, I can grow multiple plants on top of each other. Now you guys have no doubt seen those, those huh? Yeah, it, it uses hydroponic technology. It uses LED lighting. So for, I'll just jump to the point. The big unlock here is LED lighting. So, you know, I'll try to keep it clean because we're at the Arlington breakfast, but historically when you grew plants indoors, you could only grow a cash crop that was worth a lot of money. <laughs> Some of you just revealed something about yourselves, but anyways, <laughs> so you couldn't grow lettuce because lettuce is like a dollar or it's two dollars or three dollars or whatever for the product. Um, so, and that the reason for that was just from a simple engineering perspective is you had the, you had the um, expensive full spectrum light, you're burning a lot of light. The plant, this is the interesting thing, the green leafy plants that you see here can only receive about 5% of the visible light spectrum. So in other words, most of the light that's coming down from the sun or anything else is bouncing off the leaf. The leaf doesn't actually care. So with, with new high precision LED lighting, it's done two things. Number one is it drives you nuts in your neighborhood because everybody puts these blue super bright lights out on the front of their house and, you're like, and it's just, it, it's not a great look. As a society, we haven't really gotten used to how to use them properly. But when combined with a precision controller, you can tune LED lights to deliver just the part of the light spectrum that the plant wants to see. And so when you do that, then you're using, you're just sipping electricity. You're barely using electricity at all. And then somebody mentioned hydroponic, that's a good guess. So we're using hydroponic um, technology, which has been around, if you've been to Epcot, it's been there for 30 or 40 years. Um, so we're being very frugal with water. So we're cutting our water consumption by like 14x versus field crop. Yeah, so by 14 times less water. And then we're, we're using um, electricity at parity with field crop. 
So that might not make sense at first. So does it make sense that crops grown in the field use energy and electricity? I didn't get an answer. So no, it doesn't make sense, right? If you're growing it in your yard. So who's growing lettuce in your yard? Jason is, I'm sure, but you are? All right, so we have two people that are making, growing their own crops in their yard. For all the rest of you, you're buying it from California or Arizona or Mexico. So what sort of energy investment went into that produce to get harvested, washed, bagged, trucked, refrigerated, et cetera, by the time it got to you? And so, well, if we can, the value proposition is if we can make it here locally and we can sell it to you the very next day, you have a better product um, that, is, uh, that is less resource uh, intensive on the planet. So um, <clears throat> the other thing that we want to really try to do is, is we want to address uh, nutritional shortages. So uh, I was having breakfast with Ron Armstrong. He runs Sponsored by Grace. Um, Sponsored by Grace knows this too well. We have actual food deserts in this city that exist in this city. So how do you deal with that? One of the things you have to do is you have to get the right nutrition to the right people, right? You have to make that an option. Now, I live across the street from a Whole Foods. At my last place of employment before I started my company, they put in a fresh market across the street. We didn't have a food desert. It was expensive, um, but we, we had access to all the best nutrition. That's not true for all the kids in this city or even the adults. Um, so that's one of the big things we're trying to do is we want to locate these urban organic farms in places where it solves part of the food desert problem. Um, this is what it looks like. So just imagine these are basically sea containers. They're the same size as a sea container. They're actually made of a different product that's food grade washable. Remember, we come from factories, so we know how to build food factories. But um, when you look at the, the pods, it's just a bunch of sea containers. You line them up. You put a utility container on the back. So one utility container serves five grow containers. And then you can put any number of packaging or office containers on the front. So the one that we have currently planned is, um, is going to go somewhere in proximity to Edward Waters College. And, um, and it's going to be about this footprint on the first generation. And then what's going to happen is, um, over time, we will stack these on top of each other. Because they're modular, we'll end up going three high. So romaine lettuce is the comparator. It's like uh, Walmart, if, if you're buying, they want to know what can you do with romaine lettuce. They just use that as kind of like the, the measuring stick. So one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be able to grow 21 heads of romaine lettuce on one square foot. And so that's just great use of land. The other thing is we're going to be turning the lettuce heads every 19 days. So that includes planting, growing, harvesting, and cleaning. Those, all those functions happen in these pods. And we'll be turning that many heads every 19 days with one little farm. So, Let's see if we got anybody smart in the audience that can figure this out. Since we're a sea container shape, where is this going? Where is it going? You don't have to know the parcel exactly, but you could guess what attributes we're looking for in a, in a piece of land. It's going in in, huh? Close, yeah, very close. It's going in an unused parking lot. Just going in parking lot that's otherwise not helping the city. It's kind of an eyesore. It's old. We'd love an old parking lot. It's perfect for us. So this is going out in the corner, and then it's turning into jobs. You know, everybody in there is going to understand how to use robotic controllers. Everybody in there is going to understand packaging, merchandising, retailing, maybe some marketing. Um, maybe we can make some fresh spices. That would be super cool, right? And, um, and so this turns in from a, basically an unutilized asset in the community, which is a piece of parking lot, which we didn't even know we had, right? We, in Jacksonville, we have enough parking lots. And then all of a sudden, it turns into this little piece of technology that's doing something good. And it's not very expensive relative to a lot of the stuff we do on a daily basis. This is not very expensive. And, um, and so that's one of the other things, too, is you guys have heard about vertical farms. So there's, there's been many that were sponsored by um, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, they've all sponsored some sort of vertical farm concept. And it's hard to be me sometimes because I've been in the factory building business my whole career. And I look at some of these ideas and I think, oh, that is just not smart, right? That is just not going to work. <laughs> Anything works when a tech company puts $100 million into it. It works. Then when the business has to stand on its own, it falls right over. And, and that's what we've seen. Um, 
So all the big farm concepts. There was one that was a tilapia farm combined with a microgreens farm, and you'd feed the tilapia, and I won't tell you how it happens, but the tilapia feed the microgreens. <laughs> and it's a closed loop, it's called aquaponics. Is it still around? Oh, and it, and it was really cool because you could build it in Brooklyn, New York. That was the cool thing. So it's like, that's sustainable. Yep, we got a lot of old warehouses in Brooklyn, New York. We're gonna do this all over. Another one was, we're turning old steel mills into vertical farms. Okay, well, now that we're out of Pittsburgh, now that we're out of Pittsburgh, where, yeah, and the, and the contaminants, I mean, it doesn't make sense at all. Like, you look at that and you're like, that's totally not repeatable. Like, you can do that one time because you found a steel mill, and then uh, it doesn't happen again. Plus, just from a robotic perspective, we're saying, there's no way my robot's gonna get 40 feet up in the air to pick lettuce, and then I can still sell the lettuce for the same price that it is in the store. So, this concept is designed at the organic price in Walmart, and go backwards. So if you go to the shelf in Walmart, they do have organic produce. They even have hydroponically grown produce. Anything in a clamshell is a general rule of thumb. Uh, a clamshell container is probably hydroponically grown in a greenhouse already. So that's already on the market. You're already seeing it. Anything that has the live roots on it, you know, like the, the bib lettuce or the butter lettuce with the roots. So we just took that and we worked backwards. So we said, we have to have a cost input that is sustainable and scalable so that if it can compete at Walmart, it can compete anywhere. And so then that was the paradigm shift was, and we got a, we got a letter of uh, intent offtake agreement from Walmart. Here was the big idea was, um, if Walmart has the freshest lettuce, what does that do to the industry? Now I'm not favoring Walmart over anyone else. I'm just saying, what we know Walmart has the best prices. So if suddenly you can get the best quality at the best price, what sort of pressure does that put on everybody? Right, and so that is, that is gonna be interesting for the Whole Foods and the fresh markets and the Publix and all these other stores. They're gonna to have to figure out how they can get you fresher produce at a better price with a higher quality. Um, so the other thing is it's gotta be a jobs initiative. You know, that's a theme for chamber, that's a theme for economic development. Don't come to me with an economic development project if you're not talking about jobs, right? We've learned that if you've been in the space. And so when, as we look for partnerships and alliances, we have everything we need right here, including two historically black universities. Um, so we don't have to go far. And for the people that choose to be farmers or operators in the farm, you know, what are the types of things that they learn? Operations and maintenance, including the nutrient systems, the LED lighting systems, which are basically computer control systems that I talked about, the planting and harvesting on this, this 19 day cadence. Um, and then of course, the, the high technology water systems and, and uh, other support systems. So we think it's gonna be super cool. We think it's like, you know, hey, for somebody that had the choice of, of working a regular hourly job versus this, this is a career. This is something that if you get in on the ground floor, it is scalable. This, w we will be exporting this across the United States. Um, and we want Jacksonville just to be the test bed just so it gets the recognition of having, you know, help develop uh, some of the early stuff. So what's the final value prop is, um, 50% of food gets wasted. So again, that's, that's a crazy number, five zero. 50% of food gets wasted. Um, a lot of it is wasted immediately upon harvest, right? So as soon as you harvest, if you'll notice like all the produce that you buy at, at a Publix or a Winn-Dixie, it's pretty much beautiful. It all looks good. Where'd the ugly tomatoes go, right? <laughs> Where'd the apples with the spots go, okay? So, so immediately you have attrition and that's what they call field losses. You also will hear about it, you'll occasionally notice stuff goes out of, out of uh, stock seasonally because there was a blight in California or a lettuce factory in Salinas caught on fire or whatever it was. Um, there's all these kind of mega events that happen that, that lower. And then you have all this stuff that happens, the pre-processing, transportation, storage, you know, how, what percent, I don't know if anybody here's in the grocery business, but what percent of the fresh produce at Publix gets wasted before they sell it to the consumer? It's gotta be, you know, some uh, significant percent. And then finally, this is what we deal with at my house, we have, we have three kids in preschool, is uh, plate waste. You know, or at a restaurant, or at the food back here, how much of that just doesn't get eaten? So in, in some, it adds up to 50%. And we think by moving the food supply chain closer to the consumer, being much more efficient with our resources, and then being able to apply some supply chain science of how much we're planting and who we're supplying to, we can actually 
bring that in and we can have a much higher amount of food being eaten. Um, I won't get through this, I think I already talked about that. One, one fun thing we do have planned in all of our designs is a classroom. So we just add one more container and fill it with you know, student chairs. And the idea there is let's make this something that students can get inquisitive about, right? Especially if we're going into lower income neighborhoods, which is our plan, then we want those local schools to have access to this facility to create a sense of curiosity around, around nutrition, farming, science, technology, uh, anything that you might have here. Um, and then the other thing is I mentioned how cheaply we're going to do it. It's not going to always be cheap. You know, we are uh, hopefully one of the premier uh, technology engineering firms in Jacksonville at Chang Industrial. And so, of course, we want cool stuff to be on it. Just not yet, because we want it to be affordable uh, for the city to really embrace it. So we, we do believe we can get most of the power to be solar power um, over time. So this can be close to a net zero facility. Uh, mobile robotics, we do believe that the moving around of things we can do with robotics in the future. Um, packaging automation, that's been around. We've got a packaging expert in the middle of the room. Um, data exchange, um, how about getting some of this information to the Jacksonville Data Hub, which is being developed on Bay Street right now downtown. And then, um, of course, being a champion with partners like a JEA of how can we all do better with water. Um, so I'm going to pause there and see if we have any questions on the farming concept. Did you ever partner with like Misfits um, Grocery? Because that's actually where the ugly potatoes go. Is there like Misfit Box? It's actually a thing where you can get that. So like if you had ugly produce, would you also get it? Yeah, we, we, I mean, the short answer is our goal would be to see zero go to waste, right? And so, uh, and then community partnerships are how you build, you know, kind of like organic support, groundswell support. So the, um, for us, I think, the short answer is yes. I mean, I don't know them personally, but, uh, and I'm also, by the way, just to be clear, I'm not the operations leader of this. We have a deal with another group in town uh, that's a, a black female-led organization that they're going to run the operations, because I, and I warned them, we're going to build this and we're going to make it work, and then I'm gone, right? See you later. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not running a farm for the rest of my career that we're in the engineering business at my company. So we have to go do the next thing. So for so we're gonna be, we're, what we're looking to do is build strong community partnerships. And, and there was, there's gonna be a recurring revenue stream off the farm. So we wanna pair the profit-making farm with the non-profit community organization so the two have sustainability financially. That's our goal here. For the, in the plant bed? Mm -hmm. No, hyd hydroponic plants go in like a medium. It's like a filter. It looks kind of like filter medium and then the hydroponic water goes around it with the nutrients. I have three questions. Okay, we might, might get there. So how long have you been in business? Uh, Chang Industrial has been in business for six years. We were starting in 2017 on, well, are we on the campus, Dr. Simak? Is this JU? We were, start, we were started here, if this is JU. We were started at the DCOB building uh, right behind us. Uh, what are you selling exactly? Software or robots? We sell system integration. System. So we buy units of robots that somebody else makes. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you a quick example. So you guys know this robot? Uh -huh. Everybody knows that robot. What's it do? Wait a minute. A lot of smart people. What does it do? How does it make anybody money? How does it make somebody's life easier? It looks really cool at trade shows, right? That was the answer. It is so cool at a trade show. It doesn't do anything, right? So what our job is, we take, we take all this potential machinery and automation that's out there, and we tie it together in a functioning network of automation. And then what that does is it lets people make products faster, do better e-commerce delivery times. Uh, we're now in healthcare. We're making nurses' lives easier with robotics. So we, we actually have, all of our stuff has an actual ROI. It has a, a payback. And so we take a unit of one robot that somebody else built, that's a very smart person, and then we wrap that with all the different things you need so that many robots perform as like an orchestra, and then there's a ton of software involved. So we have to usually write custom. How do you scale this? 
our business is totally non-scalable. If you don't know me and I care getting Cheyenne are sitting over here, you're not getting it. It's not scalable. So it's very custom, boutique, you know, one-off shop. And that's why we reserve our time for only the projects that we're super excited about. So we, we built the most automated and largest coffee factory in the world. We love coffee. That's such a cool project for us. We're currently doing the same thing with um, a number of iconic household brands. All of our current projects are always under NDA, but um, we're doing the same thing in healthcare. We're excited about that. We're excited about the farm. We don't make any money on this farm. We're excited about the farm because it's for Jacksonville and it feeds people here. So last question. Yeah. What's your business model? For what? For if you say you are not sitting there thinking of Jackson, you have to say what's your business? Well, we, we are, we're an equity holder in the technology company that makes the hydroponic systems. So eventually, if this caught fire and had to go across the whole country, we would have to, we, we're like a, a board member of that company. So we would have to go with them and help do it. So it's not that we have no self-interest here. Um, it's, it's that we, of all the places we could have chosen to do this, we had, we had a Maricopa County in Arizona, which is Phoenix basically, courting us to come do it there. And we chose here, we want Jacksonville to be recognized for this and we want these, these guys to benefit from us coming here first. Yeah, so in the long run, I mean, I'm sure it, it's gonna be an exciting ride, but. Like the Jacksonville area, how many farms would, would you need to supply? For the whole city. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Three. Three. If we had three, we would, we would make, th th huh? For lettuce or everything? For green leafy is the category. Yeah, green leafy. So, so it's like your spinach, you know, kale, you know, arugula, that type of stuff. So three farms would accomplish the entire consumption needs of Jacksonville. And you think of like when you go, if you drive to Gainesville, just how many farms you pass, right? And that's not even really supplying us for the most part. Most of our stuff comes from out of state. So this is, this is incredibly efficient. So one of the things I didn't mention is t the fastest you can grow a field crop in California is 35 days. And I said we're, we're doing planting, growing, harvesting, cleaning, and turnaround in 19 days. So we've cut the time in half. And we're doing 21 on top of each other. So, what, so the, the way the science works on this is <clears throat> when I hook into, a, I'm just going to keep saying Walmart because you get the scale. Uh, and that's what we're thinking. This is not cute community project that feeds people at Edward Waters Cafeteria. It will. But this is, this is like change the world starting here. That's what this is. And so, um, <clears throat> so if, I, if I plug into Walmart and they know their shipping schedules from all their cold storage distribution um, facilities, and then I reverse plant. So I say, I know what you're gonna deliver and when you're gonna deliver it. I know what your store orders are. I'm gonna plant ahead of schedule and I'm gonna have the, the produce available for you one day old every day you go to ship. So then what does that do to the supply chain? That's where it, it really dramatically changes. The average shelf age of your produce right now, I don't know about you guys' experience, but at my house it's going bad really fast right now. Like, I mean, we're, we've got strawberries or we've got, uh, spinach or something home for like less than a week and it's already bad right now. And it's part of that's the seasonality. It's where did it come from and then hopefully you guys have been reading about all the food factory fires around the country. Like what's that all about? You know and so and then how does a lettuce factory burn down exactly? Because they just lost two? The two largest ones? Like it, I don't understand how that, it's full of water, isn't it? So um, so that's putting stress on the food supply chain and you're seeing it. Just like you couldn't get toilet paper a few years ago, you can't get durable fresh produce right now. It's, it's going quickly in your refrigerator or whatever. And so what the other thing this does is it dramatically changes that. Imagine if you had 12 days of shelf life in your fridge of still fresh tasting produce, you know, or 14 days of shelf life. So that's what starts to happen and that's where, the, that's where this is a very much a data science project. And so you take the seasons out of everything too, no matter whether we had a cold spell or whatever, you carry on. Seasons are out, blight is out, and then the other thing that we want to do is um, after we get to mass production of the basic, you know, let's prove that we're making like really good romaine lettuce, is um, I can't wait to have chef inspired recipes. Personally, that's what I'm looking forward to. So when do I get sriracha flavored lettuce? And you can do that, right? So again, I keep looking at, at Jason in the middle who, who grows all the spices. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you do? Like, you know that you buy certain vanilla flavors or black pepper flavors from certain places because of the locality. Well, now we have recipe control over the light, the temperature, the nutrients, all those, the airflow. We have recipe control. <laughs> Keep in mind, you're talking to robotics people. This is what we do. And so it's like, okay, suddenly we can partner with a celebrity chef and we can make new interesting flavors of boutique blends of vegetables. And so, and it's the same vegetable, it's just grown in the right environmental condition with the right nutrient supply to give it a certain flavor profile. Isn't it outside, right? It's outside in the parking lot? No, it's, it's in those container boxes. Okay. Those are sealed containers. These plants don't actually see sunlight. They just see... I don't think we put a picture in here. So I was going to say, how do you keep the bugs out of it if it's outside in a person? Oh, yeah. That's no, we, tower garden is we have no blight. That's the other thing, too, is, and if we did have a blight, it's contained in just one container, right? It's not sweeping across the whole Midwest or sweeping across the whole Southwest of the country. If we did have a blight or some issue, we just lose one container, not even all five, because they're, they're walled off. Um, and then there's a cleaning cycle between the next planting. How we do it on time? Well, we're uh, one more question. All right. I just can I ask a quick yeah. Question? So, how large is the overall? Is the space like the initial space? So I have my little specs on here. This is like this is what we used when I went looking for land. We actually already got land for the first site, but it's uh, 70 feet by 70 feet. Okay. So a seat container is 40 feet long by 8 feet wide. So if you just remember that arrangement I had where we're clustering them together. The basic footprint we need without parking is 70 by 70. So it's like nothing. And when we were looking in Jacksonville, we were looking at the, uh, the Northwest Corridor, like the Edward Waters Corridor, and we were also looking at the Springfield East Jacks Corridor. And the reason we had to clarify it like this is in East Jacksonville, they just have a bunch of lots, right? They just have those long, skinny Springfield House lots. So I was just explaining, I just need two lots to do all this, right? And uh, in the northwest side, you have parking lots, so, so that's what we ended up taking was a parking lot. But one more question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, a lot of chemicals used in this to get them to grow like that and to have the hit rate and system like that. No, it's so that's the interesting thing. This is all certified organic. Okay. <clears throat> so all the produce, the only produce that will be made is certified organic, and it's already happening. That's the key to understand is when you go to Whole Foods, Publix, Fresh Market, Walmart. Again, anything in a clamshell was grown hydroponically in a greenhouse. So this is the same growing technique as existing certified produce. Do you know the uh, Tina Green Legacy Farms? Uh -uh. Them. Yes. We'll, we'll hang out over here in the corner. We'd love some intros. Yeah. Oh, where's the banker? Is, are, you, are you paying for this? I forgot to ask. <laughs> I watched that presentation you gave about helping communities, so <laughs> I'll be here after. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yep.